Welcome back to Civil Wars. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on insurgency. One thing that I probably should have brought up when I started the lectures on terrorism, and is also true about insurgency here, is that we don't really know as much about this topic compared to other topics that we've covered in the past. And if you think about this, that should actually make sense, and the reason should be pretty straightforward. A lot of research interest comes from where United States government dollars go for the purposes of understanding international security. Before 2001, how much did the United States government care about terrorism and insurgency as opposed to more traditional sorts of conflict and warfare? Well, the answer is the United States government really didn't care very much about that until we had the September 11th attacks. And it's only then do you see lots more federal dollars funneling into programs, research programs, to figure out these sorts of things. So both the literatures and terrorism and insurgency, while they predate 2001, obviously, there is a lot more more interest academically in both of those topics following the September 11th attacks. What that means is that we don't really have very well-defined answers to these sorts of questions. They're very important questions, obviously, especially if you're someone concerned with the United States foreign policy at the moment. But nonetheless, unfortunately, we can't give you very firm answers to those questions because this sort of literature is new. So what I'm going to be doing in this lecture is to try to explain what we kind of know and what we kind of don't know about the origins of insurgency. I've linked to you uh, at the bottom of this, underneath the lecture video, there should be a description that has a link to uh, an article by James Furon and David Layton that really starts a huge literature on the origins of insurgency. So I'm going to explain what they find, their results, and I'm also going to talk about what results we've had since then that oftentimes contradict this, which means that's, well, sort of a bad thing if you're looking for solid answers, because I can't give you solid answers. I'm going to be very back and forth and wishy-washy about what is true and what's not true. All right, well, let's talk about five possible explanations for why we might see more insurgencies in some places than in others. One might be a lack of a kingmaker, the unavailability, or, uh, the unavailability of military resources for a particular group in a country, which is going to allow that group to take over the entire country and eradicate any insurgency inside of it. We might be looking also at things that are true not on international fronts about being able to make a king in a country, but also qualities about the government inside of a country that is in a civil war and is perhaps facing an insurgency, like ethnic diversity in the country, religious diversity in the country, uh, whether the weak, uh, whether the government in charge is a weak government or a strong government, and also the sort of terrain around the country. All right, well, let's go through these one by one. One thing that we can actually be fairly sure of is this theory about a kingmaker. So what this is looking at is what happens before the Cold War and what happens after the Cold War. During the Cold War, leaders could easily draw support from superpowers. So if I was some dictator, some evil dude in some random country and I was facing an insurgency, I could go to the Soviet Union and say, look, there are these fascist, capitalist, democratic pigs that are launching this insurgency campaign in my country. You don't like those sorts of groups, so you should give me some military funding and that will allow me to eradicate them. Or similarly, if instead of going to the Soviet Union, I could, in the exact same country, claim that the insurgents are communist pigs, and so the United States should give me some money to eradicate the communists in the country. Something like that. You can play off the superpower competition to get a lot more arms into your country, which then allows you to surely be able to eradicate the insurgency that's going on. In other words, military assistance ends wars, and during the Cold War, you were able to get military insurgent or military assistance much more easily. What that would mean then is that no Cold War means a lack of assistance, which means no complete victory over insurgents, which means more insurgents and more ongoing war. But the question here is, does the lack of a kingmaker actually cause more insurgencies to start? Not talking about the length of an insurgency, but whether an insurgency starts or not. And what I said at the beginning here when we were talking about a kingmaker is that we know that really this isn't the case, and that comes back down to that graph that I showed you way back at the beginning of this course. This is the graph of number of ongoing wars, average length of ongoing wars, and the number of new wars in a particular year. I actually got this data from the article that I'm talking about here, the one that's linked below in the comments section, and what we know just by looking at this, or looking at this graph is that 
What we see is a spike in the number of wars that start immediately following the Cold War, but after that spike sort of disappears for obvious reasons, there's no more Soviet successor states, all the Soviet successor states are already out there, there's no more incentive to start a post-Soviet war that didn't exist already back in 1990 and 1991. So what we see here is that the spike is just the result of European wars going on, post-Soviet successor state wars, that sort of thing and not a trend of a lack of a kingmaker. So over time, after the Cold War ends, we don't really see more civil wars occurring because of a lack of superpower competition and a lack of arms coming to those countries as a result. So that's something that we are a little bit more firm on. The rest of these things are still up for debate. So well, well, I actually co uh, combined a couple of here, ethnic and religious diversity in a country. You might think that having more ethnic or more religious groups in a country would cause more disagreement, possible disagreement in a country, and then more fighting as a result, more insurgencies as one ethnic group or one religious group starts an insurgency in the mountains in some part of your country and then continues that conflict for a long time. Now, that might be one initial theory that you have, but of course, if we think back to the first few lectures of this course on bargaining theory, what we would then want to know is why is it the case that suppose you do have more groups in your country, why is it the case that you're actually fighting more groups? Why isn't it the case that you're negotiating when negotiating would leave both sides better off than if you had started a conflict? Now, that's why you might not think that ethnic and religious diversity actually should be causing more war. If you look at the article, again, that's below here, that starts off this literature on insurgency and what's actually a very strong claim and part of what causes a lot of people to start writing articles in response to this is that they find that once you control for other factors like the amount of money your country has, how wealthy of a country you are, these ethnic and religious diversity problems don't actually cause any sort of extra additional conflict in your country. Of course, again, this literature and insurgency is back and forth. There are a lot of other studies after that, afterward, after this one that comes out, that say the exact opposite. So really, I think, to be fair, this is still an ongoing debate, whether ethnic or religious diversity in a country is actually a cause of a war, which might not be exactly what policymakers or your average Joe on the street or conventional wisdom would say, which is that ethnic and religious diversity, of course, that causes more conflict. We actually don't really know that at this point right now. Well, one other possibility, one other reason why you might see more insurgency in a country is because of weak governments. Weak governments give rebel groups a greater chance of winning, so that gives me more incentive to actually start an insurgency, which would then lead to more fighting. And what we see in the article presented below is that they do find support for this. They do see that where we see weak governments, we also see more insurgency. But again, I have this bullet point here. Does that actually mean that we should be expecting more insurgency? Again, going back to bargaining theory, well, bargaining theory says that if you're a weak government, that just means that you should be expecting to win less if you go to war, which in turn means that you should be less demanding at the bargaining table and you should still be able to hammer out a negotiated agreement. One thing that actually a, a student in one of my classes brought up is that maybe this is actually an artifact of the idea or the, the possibility that a weak government actually has worse intelligence about the rebel group. And what we know about intelligence and incomplete information is that if you're not knowing exactly how powerful or how committed one side is, your opponent's opposing side is, to maintaining the peace versus going to war, you might be overly aggressive in your bargaining demands and that might lead to conflict. So maybe it's not actually the weak governments that is causing there to be more conflict, the idea that I'm just not a very militarily powerful government that's causing there to be more conflict. Maybe that's just associated or related to uh, situations where governments are having worse times or harder times acquiring good intelligence. Again, this is something that's still up in the air and I can't give you a definitive answer to it. Lastly, terrain. You might think that rougher terrain, that is having like mountains in your country or also having non-contiguous territory would give uh, an insurgent group or a rebel group better hiding places. And if you have better hiding places, then you should see more insurgency. Again, this is problematic if you think about this in terms of bargaining theory, because just because I have this place to hide doesn't mean we should be getting into a conflict. It means that we should just be bargaining more and the potential rebel group or insurgent group should be getting more to reflect the fact that they have better hiding places. What the article says that is linked is that there is an association between terrain and non-contiguous territory and more counter or rather more insurgency. 
But what really does get a lot of attention following this article is whether this terrain hypothesis holds. So what some other people have done after this is look at where exactly rebel groups or where insurgent groups are placed. And what they find is that groups that are further from the capital are more likely to engage in insurgency. So if I am statu- or if I'm situated really far away from your capital city, then I'm more likely to be involved in these conflicts. And they also find that territorial, uh, rather terrain only matters for territorial ethnic conflict. So again, these are mixed results. I've shown you what is, is, is said in the article that's linked below, but I've also said to you, and I want to be very clear about this and emphasize the fact that this is still up for debate. What's going on in this literature that follows is very back and forth. And so at this point, I can't really tell you whether those things, ethnic diversity, religious diversity, weak governments or terrain, rough terrain is actually causing extra insurgencies to occur or if there's something else going on and we're just missing out at it, missing out on it in these statistical studies. This is rough. This is an early period in this research agenda. And well, there's still a lot more to do. So I'm sorry I couldn't say any more. Perhaps if I redo this course in 10 years, I'll be able to give you firmer answers. All right. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I hope to see you next time. Take care.